Good morning and welcome to our service of Sunday the 14th of March. You will have heard uh, in the news or from the First Minister's announcement that if all carries on as it is at the moment, then churches will be permitted to return to in-person worship from Palm Sunday. As I record this, it's still Friday and we have put it out to our Kirk session um, to gauge their opinion as to whether we should return uh, on Palm Sunday for in-person worship. So I should be able to confirm in the email that goes out today, i.e. Sunday, whether or not that will be going ahead. Um, but anyway, keep an eye on the email for information about that. If we do return to in-person worship, then booking uh, and those kind of things will once more be needed. We gather to worship God and uh, we begin our service by singing hymn 115, Love is the Touch of Intangible Joy. Mm. is where love is, for love is of God. Let us turn to this God in prayer. Let us pray. We come, dear Lord, to worship and praise you with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. In you we find the source of our being, the foundation of love, and the wellspring of relationship. It is to you we turn this day from the business of another week with all of its cares and concerns, joys and worries, successes and failings. For we give thanks that you journey with us, knowing us as a loving parent knows their child. We praise you for the observations and encounters recorded in Scripture, for us to ponder. Conversations with scribes and rulers, glimpses of a poor widow offering all she has. And we wonder what your son, Jesus, might remark about us if he stood and watched us for a day. Would he point to us and our actions as an example of the life of the kingdom? 
Some days he might, on other days, not so much. Lord, we give thanks for those days when we make a difference, when we raise ourselves to the challenge of your way, when we take the steps towards your ministry with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And yet, Lord, we also recognize that on other days we get it wrong. We make bad decisions. We think solely of ourselves. We neglect the harm we do to others. And we fail to contribute to your kingdom. Forgive us, Lord, and create a new spirit in us. Remake us in your image. We pray for the coming of your kingdom through the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever. Amen. We read this morning from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Then we skip a few verses and go to 38. 44. Reading from Mark chapter 12. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Down opposite the plate, place where the offerings were put and watch the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put into the treasury more than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. And we give thanks to God for this reading from his holy word. This whole passage that we've just read took place in the temple courts. You remember last week I preached on Jesus clearing out the temple um, 
throwing over the tables of coins and so on, and chasing the, the sacrificial animals and the people that sold them out of the temple courts. A lot of what happens in the final week of Jesus' life is centered on Jerusalem and especially the temple. So these conversations are also happening in the temple courts. And when we take that very last scene of our reading of Jesus sitting, observing where people are giving their offerings in a special area of the temple, and when he sees the poor widow throw in two little coins and he calls his disciples and says, look, she has given more proportionately than any of the rich people that have just given large amounts. I wonder what kind of sermon you would now expect me to preach on the basis of that image, on the the basis of that story. It seems like a great example to encourage generosity in giving to the church, doesn't it? Perhaps our finance and stewardship convener is now hoping that I will um, make a strong plea for people to give to the church and give more. Uh, because we've got the shortfalls from last year through to COVID and uh, no rental income for the whole. Um, we've got uh, a, we've discovered that the chimney on the roof is crumbling and needs repaired or replaced. And so that even the scaffolding alone is going to cost a lot of money. So that's the kind of sermon perhaps you would expect me to preach on the basis of the the widow, the poor widow with her mites, with her small copper coins. But is this what this passage is actually about, about sacrificially giving and holding up the widow as an example to follow? Is Jesus doing that? Is he putting her in the spotlight to make that point, an example to be followed? Or instead, is she a tragic figure, giving beyond her means, encouraged to do so by religious leaders, to a temple that will come to ruin in just a few decades? The real focus in the wider passage, as we've read it, is on the scribes, the teachers of the law. I'm just going to reread a couple of verses in the message translation for you. Jesus said, watch out for the religion scholars. They love to walk around in academic gowns, preening in the radiance of public flattery, basking in prominent positions, sitting at the head table at every church function. And all the time they are exploiting the weak and helpless. The longer their prayers, the worse they get. But they'll pay for it in the end. Ouch. Jesus doesn't pack any punches. Even though the earlier conversation between the scribe and Jesus about the greatest commandment seemed fairly civilized and respectful, in this comment Jesus is back to full-on confrontation and accusation. Now we are perhaps used to the scribes and the Pharisees being portrayed as the bad guys in Mark's gospel. But who exactly were they? And what did the scribes do? Scribes had knowledge of the law, and in the case of uh, Judea and Israel, that was basically the, the law of the land was also the religious laws, kind of one the same thing. And scribes could draft legal documents, such as contracts for marriage, divorce, loans, inheritance, mortgages, sale of land, etc. And every village would at least have one scribe. Most people, of course, would not have been literate anyway. So scribes had considerable standing in the community, and sometimes scribes were also Pharisees, or Pharisees were scribes, but they were of a particular uh, religious and political persuasion, so it's not the same thing, but quite often it was. So scribes 
where respected figures typically in the community, and we can imagine that they would like to be recognized and respected and given VIP treatment. Scribes could wear longer robes than a normal working person because they weren't doing anything you know, practical like a trade um, where they would need to hoist up their clothing. So we can maybe picture them swishing about the streets in their wide robes and nodding left and right, getting noticed. In days gone by in Scotland and other places, doctors and ministers would have expected a similar reaction in many villages and towns. They were known and noticed and would like to would have likely got or expect to get best seats in the house at any community event. Those were the good old days, eh? So why does Jesus accuse the scribes or the legal experts of devouring widows' houses? Scribes would be involved in drawing up and executing legal contracts, and they would charge a fee. Widows, who would not be able to read or write typically, were dependent on this kind of support and they could easily be exploited. can't read what, you know, what's been written, then um, you're in a very vulnerable position. And they were anyway, once they were widowed. And those who were poor were at even greater risk of being led to financial ruin in this way. All throughout the Old Testament, the widows and the orphans are held up at the, as the group at most risk of poverty and exploitation. And as the ones that God's people need to take most care of, God was on their side and would not overlook mistreatment or exploitation of the most vulnerable in society. Now, I know that for many of us listening today, if I look at the demographic of our congregation, of the village to a certain extent, this is a problem that other people have. But this kind of injustice is not spiritually irrelevant. It is something that is a touchstone of true devotion to God, a test of our religion. <clears throat> test of our love. As Jesus said, we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, all our mind and our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus, in his critique of the scribes, is attacking a way of being religious and respected that is unconcerned with other people. So if we return to the poor widow in the story, rather than being held up as an example for sacrificial giving, we can now perhaps see her in a new light. Jesus comments that she has given more than those who give out of their wealth. But she's given all she's got because she's destitute. Jesus, however, doesn't say follow her example or she is close to the kingdom of God, as we might expect him to say, or she's got great faith. Here, instead, in light of what we've just heard about scribes devouring widows' housing, we are made to wonder how she's become so poor. Has she been exploited? Who has let this happen? If we saw someone given their last pennies to the church, would we not, find un not feel uncomfortable or try to stop them? There are plenty of examples of TV preachers encouraging people to give to their ministries to get a blessing or some kind of healing and meanwhile, we then find out that these preachers live in excessive luxury. Religious exploitation, we might call that. <clears throat> Maybe the poor widow is included in this story not to hold her up as an example of true faith and devotion, but as someone to be pitied and lamented. 
her presence and her financial condition accuses the religious and political establishment. How has this happened on their watch? <clears throat> and perhaps to make the whole thing even more tragic, if we read on a few uh, verses beyond what we've read today, Jesus will tell us about the destruction of the temple. This widow's sacrifice, giving all she's got, is in vain. If you consider that within a few decades, this whole building will lie in ruins. As the clever scribe had remarked, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important to God than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. The religious scholars knew this, but they didn't live by this principle. <clears throat> so, where do we go with all of this? I guess one takeaway for us is that those of us who have more power, possessions, influence, time, those of us, of us who have more will be held more accountable by God for how they have acquired those things and how they have used them. If we have investments, then we should ask if these are ethical. When we buy clothes or products in the stores, we should wonder what has gone into producing these things. And if people at home or abroad or the environment isn't being exploited and damaged in doing so. Are we prepared to pay more so that everyone gets a fair deal. And that applies both on the national as well as international level. Now I know, because I'm a consumer too, and I don't always live by that rule, it can feel that life already is too complicated to try and work out what is a fair product and a fair price. It feels that perhaps we haven't got the time to pay much attention to these things, and yet we cannot pretend to not know. I've also wondered how this story applies to the church. How does this shape the church's stewardship of the gifts that it receives? We know that the income for the Church of Scotland nationally has been reduced by 20% last year because of the pandemic. And it is expected that that will be the same for 2021, partly due to reduction in giving, but also uh, some churches being much more dependent on uh, letting out their halls, etc. A forecast has been made that by the end of 2025, the Church of Scotland will only be able to afford 600 full-time ministries. And that includes both ministers and other uh, paid posts. Currently, that figure is about 800, as in as how many people are employed in that way. So presbyteries are faced with making very drastic presbytery plans, which will mean closures and unions. And we have been told repeatedly that there are too many buildings that we are looking after and repairing, which is a huge drain on financial but also human resource. So are we asking congregations to keep giving for buildings that we really ought to let go of? What does it mean to be good stewards in that context? Yet when it comes to unions, people mostly care more about hanging on to their buildings than they care to reach the people in their communities with the gospel. It is an uncomfortable message this morning that Jesus has for us all, and I've kind of struggled to write the sermon this week. I don't think I can make it any more palatable. I would encourage you, however, to search your own heart and to examine your own spending, your investing, and your giving. Does it reflect the priorities and the values of God's kingdom? And the same question is for the Kirk session as we approve another annual budget and look to the future. Does it reflect 
the priorities of God's kingdom. And if it doesn't, then how can we make steps to change this? I'll put my disclaimer in for the stewardship committee. Of course, we do need to look after this building as long as we have it and it's ours to look after. But as we also prepare a few uh, months ahead for Christian Aid Week, you know, it's for all of us to consider how much do we give to the church and could we give more to those kind of causes. Jesus came to proclaim good news to the poor and to set the oppressed free. As his church, we share in his calling. So how do we live this? How do we love our neighbours as ourselves? Amen. We are going to sing a psalm. It's hymn 39, God the Lord, the King Almighty. Let us pray. Jesus, your message to us is uncomfortable on many accounts. We know we are to love God with all that we, that we are and all that we have, but we struggle with putting you first. And we know that to love God, to love you, means we have to love our neighbour. And that is possibly even harder. We put ourselves first most of the time. We don't really want to know what impact our actions, our spending, our investing have on other people at home or abroad. It seems too complicated and too costly to change our ways and to choose fairer 
greener, more sustainable options. And yet we know that you will hold us to account as stewards of many good gifts. Help us as individuals and as a church to be truly your disciples and to care about the things that you care about. That as we pray for situations and for people, we not only ask you to help, but also do what we can do ourselves. Lord, we give thanks for your blessings and even for the challenges of life through which we learn to trust you more deeply. On this day, we give thanks for the love of those who have mothered us, and we ask you to hold those who have not received this love and care in their lives. We give thanks for those entrusted to us to care for and love, and we pray for strength and patience as we do so. We pray for those who would have loved to have been mothers and aren't or won't. Hold them in this pain. We pray for those who have lost, lost their mothers to estrangement through memory loss or death. Hold them in their grief. We pray for mothers around the world who have to struggle to provide even the most basic necessities for their children or themselves. And after the week that's been, we pray for women and girls in this country and all over the world who are often not safe. We pray for the family of Sarah Everard in London. God have mercy. You say through your prophet Isaiah, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. God, we need comforting. We need holding. We are weary and worn. Hold us all in your embrace long enough to soothe us. So we may go from here calmer, loved, and whole, ready and refreshed to love others. In this moment of silence, imagine yourself being held by God, like a child in the embrace of its mother. God, we thank you for your love, expressed and made clear to us through the life of Jesus. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is hymn 502, Take My Life, Lord, Let It Be.
into this week. Love God above all other things and love your neighbour as yourself. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.